Good afternoon. Thank you to everyone joining us and welcome to a special virtual event celebrating International Women's Day. My name is Alex Tichinoff and I'm a staff member here at the Office of the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario and I'll be serving as your MC this afternoon. Please note that our event is being recorded and features live closed captioning. You can enable the captions by pressing the CC button at the bottom of your screen. I would like to begin today's event by asking all of you with us today to join me in pausing to recognize that while we come together with guests from a wide geographic range, the office of the Lieutenant Governor is situated on lands that have been stewarded and shaped from time immemorial by Indigenous peoples. In particular, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. I am now so proud to turn the event over to our host, only the third ever woman Lieutenant Governor of this province, the Honorable Elizabeth Dowdswell. Your Honor. Thank you so much, Alex. And hello, everyone. Bonjour, bonjour. Happy International Women's Day. We are so excited to bring you this conversation with a group of such impressive women today. Some years ago, a colleague of mine at the United Nations Federico Mayor penned words that are so appropriate to this day, and that's how I'd like to start. So I quote a few of his phrases, which are part of a, a statement of aspiration for all of us. Woman, you brought with you a new song, but we did not let you speak out, although yours is the voice of half the earth. Woman, your eyes saw the world another way but we did not want to know the meaning and warmth of your vision. Woman, with no other master but yourself, live from now on equal and free, now as companion, sharing the same dream forever. This is indeed a day of celebration, but also a call for action because there does remain much unfinished business. You know, every time you see me at a public event, whether it's in the Lieutenant Governor's suite or anywhere else around the province, you'll usually see someone in uniform. And these are my aide de camp. We undertake more than 700 events a year. And these volunteer aides are such an instrumental part of the people who support me. So today, as we celebrate women, women, I want to introduce you to a few members, just a few of the members of the household, some exceptional women, all accomplished in their fields with ranks and titles to prove it, all professionals with leadership capabilities. But as you'll hear in conversation this afternoon, they are so much more. These are women you will want to know. And now I'd ask them all to turn on their videos so we can see them. This is an unusual role for me to play. I get to ask questions and uh, essentially going to have about three different sets of questions. But I'm going to start with perhaps the most important one and that is who on earth are you? I want you to be, to tell people who you are and I'm going to call you by your first names because that's how I know you. That's the kind of family we are and you are part of my extended family. But I want you to introduce yourself with all the appropriate titles that you have because it gives a real illustration of the depth of your expertise. So I'm going to start with Robin in the top corner. And I do that because I am so very proud that I was able during my tenure to appoint the first ever woman as chief aide de camp for the Lieutenant Governor. And that's Robin. And so Robin, I'm going to ask you to tell people a little bit about who you are, where you've been, what your journey has been. Well, good afternoon, Your Honor. First of all, it's always such a pleasure to, uh, to see you and, and work with you. And uh, uh, greetings to everybody that's tuning into this webinar today. Um, how exciting uh, for a bunch of gals 
that work for you, Your Honor, um, in the capacity of volunteer and aide de camp to uh, come together and share some of our experiences. So quick question, because I know we only have an hour and a half. Um, I will, or I will, in answer to your question, I'm Robin McElary Downer. I have completed almost four decades of policing. Uh, the 30, first 36 was with the Ontario Provincial Police, which is a state police in uh, Ontario. And uh, then um, the last three years, uh, I served for a municipal police service, a small service called South Simcoe Police and uh, gave me the opportunity that I had never had before, but to police my own backyard and, and to work with my community. I retired in December of uh, 2020 and uh, was tickled pink, Your Honor, when you asked me to become your chief aide de comp. Um, I don't know why you did. I, don't, I never felt that I've been able to uh, do everything I want to do for you, but uh, what an honor it is to be your your uh, chief aide de comp. I've been an aide de comp since 20, or I'm sorry, 2002. And I had a very young family, a boy and a girl, and I was coaching uh, girls baseball in the summer and girls hockey in the winter. My husband was off with my son and uh, baseball. And uh, I was tapped on the shoulder by my commissioner of the day, who's asked me to be an aide de comp. Uh, and that largely I was asked because my duties at the time took me right into Dundas and uh, Young Street, where I worked for an investigate under an investigation of grants. And uh, I, I got to be honest with you, Your Honor, I went home and I said to my husband, I've got nothing more on my plate. I have nothing more to give. I'm maxed to the ta maxed out with work, with travel, and now I'm being asked to serve as an aide de comp. And I knew the answer before I even broached it with him is that you never say no to your commissioner. Um, so, so I accepted it gracefully. And uh, I'll tell you, it was the best thing I ever did. It, it, it amazes me, Your Honor, how we think we're so busy with work and personal life. And, you, and yet you can find more room on that dinner table or on that dinner plate if you really want something. And uh, I've never looked back uh, since 2002. And it's just been just such a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. So again, thank you for having us today, Your Honor. And I think I answered that almost fully. Not, not quite. Why did you go into policing in the first place? Uh, Your Honor, it was something I wanted to do since I was uh, five years old. Goofy story. Um, my dad was an OPP officer and I would watch him get dressed every day. And I would, I remember so clearly at five years old, I said, daddy, when I'm old enough, I'm going to be a policeman like you. Of course, we never worried about gender issues back then. Right. And uh, he laughed and he said, well, that's really nice, Bobby, but the OPP don't hire women. And I, and to that, I responded, I said, well, then I'll be the first. So I wasn't the first. Um, in 1974, the OPP took on their first uh, group of women, and uh, I was fortunate to um, take a call from my dad that day, and he said, Bobby, they've, they've done it. They've hired the women. So uh, I knew I would follow shortly. In 1981, I joined the OPP, and I was just uh, living a, a lifelong dream. I, I was nosy. I I was curious, I drove my dad nuts all the time. What are you doing? What do you, and he would never talk to me about his job. I just knew it was exciting. And um, anyway, so that's, that's how I got here. It's just, it was a lifelong dream. Isn't that amazing though, that 1974 doesn't seem that long ago. And to, to know that we had an entire uh, provincial police force that had no women in it by that time, that, that's unthinkable in this day and age, is it not? It, you know, uh, Your Honor, I, I became, uh, I was mentored by a commissioner, Commissioner Emeritus Eric Silk, um, who was our commissioner from 63 to 73. And uh, I, it's a long story how we got connected, but he mentored me um, after, I got to know him after I left the, or after he retired. Um, and he, he often said, Robin, I'm the guy that stopped the women coming on to the OPP. And yet we became close, very, very close. He taught me so much. He taught me uh, how to behave in the OPP, what to expect. 
the he, he was just a wonderful mentor and yet he often said he he didn't want women and he didn't think there was a place for us and I think I kind of turned him around a bit because I um because he liked me <laughs> it goes a long way <laughs> great well let me turn next to Maggie then um Maggie is one of those people who is constantly on the move and this is my first occasion to welcome her back. She has been an aide de camp, but then she takes promotions that take her across the country and then we have to woo her back home. So Maggie, it's great to see you again. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Your Honor, uh, both for uh, taking me back um, and uh, for letting me be here today. I'm humbled to be amongst all these other ladies. It's so a uh, great idea uh, that you and the team had to bring everyone together. Um, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Maggie Jacula, and as Her Honor said, uh, I was an aide de camp originally a few years ago when we were posted in Borden, uh, but my military uh, career took us to Winnipeg, Manitoba for two years, and then on to Comox, BC for two years. Uh, but fortunately, uh, we are back here in Ontario, and we are not leaving Ontario, so uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, but you are stuck with me uh, forever. Um, but uh, within the CAF, I uh, have been in for 26 years between reserve and reg force time. I'm an aerospace engineer and uh, yeah, very excited to be here today. Tell us a little more about your what motivated you to join the military. Uh, well, I believe that my mom and dad are on the line uh, today, but oh. uh, I come from a military family, Your Honor. So between uh, my mom was a nurse in the Air Force and my dad was an army uh, logistician. So I grew up in a family um, that was always surrounded by the military. My grandfather um, was in the Merchant Marines in World War II. My uncles uh, were in the military and the Coast Guard. So we just had a family of service and um, similar to Robin's story about policing, um, I knew from a young age that I wanted to be in the military. I, my dad would be able to correct me, uh, but I believe uh, when I was about grade six, we did a tour of Royal Roads University and I asked the commandant if I could start. Um, that's how badly I wanted to go uh, to RMC, the Royal Military College of Canada and keep serving. So uh, that's what drove me through all of high school just so that I would have that uh, opportunity and without a doubt, uh, best choice. Um, that I made. I've loved my career in the RCAF and I'm very grateful that, uh, you know, I'm back here in Ontario and can serve you as well, ma'am. Did you, uh, did you find any particular barriers as you were uh, going through your training? Uh, your Honor, I was really fortunate. I appreciate that not everyone has had the uh, same experience and everyone should have the same experience. Um, however, my training has always been uh, a place of respect. I've uh, made great, great lifelong friends with uh, the folks I did my basic training with. Um, the gentlemen that I served with always have had my back and they continue to do so to this day. Uh, but I was also really fortunate. Uh, my mother is an exceptionally strong-willed woman and uh, she taught me to uh, advocate for myself. Um, so between a, a combination of the right environment and folks who are super respectful and, you know, that nurturing uh, attitude from my family, um, I was really fortunate that uh, my career has been very positive. That's great. Great to hear. PJ, you're next on my list. And uh, PJ is... Um, one of those women who has found a way of combining various passions. Uh, one of those passions is the military uh, and the other is music. So um, with that as an entree, uh, tell us your story. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as Your Honor said, I'm Captain PJ Van Auken. Um, I serve a few roles in the military right now. Uh, the first is the officer commanding C squadron for the Governor General's Horse Guards, which is a reserved armored unit in Toronto and I am the first female squadron commander within the unit. Um, I also serve as the senior brass and reed band advisor for the Canadian Army headquarters. So, um, and I'm not the first woman for that job. Um, I started in the military in 1991 
uh, as a musician. And three or four years later, I changed trades and I became an armored crewman. Um, and uh, early training days, um, it wasn't uncommon for me to be the only woman on, on my courses because uh, women had only been in combat arms, I believe since 1987, somebody else can jump in and correct me, but I believe 1987. So it had only been five years or so uh, that we had been in combat arms roles when I started doing armored crewman training. Um, I've gone back to the band branch. I took my commission in 2010 and uh, have been an officer since that point. Um, I started as an aide de camp at the beginning of your tenure, Your Honor. Um, I had had through music a couple of uh, connections with your predecessor and a couple of events that um, I had the opportunity to step in unofficially and assist and it was at uh, his uh, suggestion that I reached out to the chief aide de camp at the time who I believe is on I think I saw a comment from him uh, now retired Lieutenant Commander Wong uh, and applied for, for the position. So as a reservist I only do military part-time. I also own a management and leadership training company. Um, I have published one book and my second book should be out in a couple of weeks just putting the final touches on it. Um, in terms of family, I have two children, uh, both serve in the military, uh, they're both in their 20s. And uh, yeah, I think that covers me, doesn't it? I, th I think we're beginning to see a pattern here of, uh, of uh, member family members emulating other family members. But you didn't tell the most important story, PJ. Oh. Okay. Which is that I believe she is the only person, the only woman in North America who actually is able to conduct a band from the back of a horse, right? It is that, Your Honor. Um, <laughs> it was at a Queen's Plate where I needed to be in two places at once. I needed to ride with our cavalry squadron and I needed to conduct the band. And I wasn't really sure how I was going to pull that off until I decided, well, let's see what happens. Uh, my horse took quite quite well to it and it became a thing that I would conduct the band uh, especially at the Queen's Plate but I've done it at a couple of occasions now uh, from the back of my horse. It is impressive. Thank you your honor. Absolutely. Um, let's turn next to Dee uh, and Dee is one of the she's not uh, the aide de camp consequently no uniform today but she is one of those volunteers and um, Dee, I, I'm really intrigued by uh, your background uh, working for the archives. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about, about your um, uh, background uh, academically and also, uh, also in terms of career path. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for having me today. And uh, yeah, so I started, um, oh my gosh, I went to university uh, back in the early 2000s for photography. And during that time, I realized that I was more interested in researching about the places that I was photographing rather than taking the photos. And that led me to uh, become a summer student at the Archives of Ontario. And I did my master's in photographic preservation and collections management. I was part of the first cohort of the program and it's now being around probably for about 15 years. And um, so then after I finished school, I went back and went back to the Archives of Ontario and I've worked as an archivist. I've been senior conservator. I was manager of digitization operations and now I'm manager of special projects. So they have me on higher end things. So I've worked in a lot of different areas of the institution and my passion for preserving historical collections has actually extended beyond that. I, uh, I've been fortunate enough to take part in an amazing program with the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's called Save Our Af African American Treasures and it's similar to Antiques Roadshow except that we don't give monetary appraisals. We just uh, invite the public to bring their family heirlooms in and we give preservation advice. And I actually spearheaded a project where we make custom boxes for uh, 
participants who come in because it's it was always really heartbreaking to see people who would literally take two or three buses to get to a location and they'd bring these amazing things in and boxes from the grocery store or pillowcases or shopping bags and so we make custom containers on the spot so making boxes is kind of my thing the other thing that I do is I teach as part of the same program at Ryerson so the photographic preservation and collections management program and I teach the photographic preservation course a course that I designed and I've been teaching it for about nine years now so I've been fortunate enough to become part of the household because I was at a dinner party with a couple of other volunteers and the chief aide at the time was there and tapped me on the shoulder and said, would you consider this opportunity? I said, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be an uh, opportunity of a lifetime. Well, I can tell you that, um, that uh, we, we seem to have a very small space here at Queen's Park. Either that or we've got a lot of artifacts and they keep growing and growing. And uh, as we were preparing for today's uh, uh, event, uh, we wanted to find some information and some photographs of uh, aide de camp in the past. And I realized just how much work we have yet ahead of us to just keep track of, of what we do on a daily basis. Uh, and find room to, to store all of these wonderful treasures that we are given from time to time. So you'll be, uh, there'll be things for you to do for a long time to come, Dee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on my list is Darren. Hi, Your Honor, how are you? Well, thanks. Good. So my name is Darren Rietze. I'm the fire chief and director of emergency management for Mississauga Fire and Emergency Services. I started with Vaughn Fire actually in 2001 and I worked my way up through the ranks uh, fairly quickly. In about my 13th year, I was a, a captain, uh, the rank of a captain, and there was a, a competition for the deputy fire chief position. My platoon chief suggested that I compete. Now it's very unusual to go from a a captain position into a deputy position because you're skipping the rank of a district chief and a platoon chief. Um, but my platoon chief, uh, who I would say was one of my mentors, suggested that I just put my name in so I have a seat at the table so the fire chief can hear my ideas and uh, just to learn a little bit more about myself. So I put my, uh, my resume in. I went through five rounds of interviews and somehow successfully uh, managed to get the deputy fire chief position. So I served in, in Vaughan for about six years before I was promoted. Uh, I competed and promoted for the fire chief's position. And, uh, and now I've competed and I was successful at um, getting the fire chief's position in Mississauga. So I currently lead 750 men and women of the Mississauga Fire and Emergency Services. But you weren't always in, uh, in the fire business, were you? That's right, Your Honor. So that's how my story differs from many of these uh, women. I was a teacher before that. And so I followed the family business. My father was a teacher. My mother was a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher. My older sister was a teacher. Therefore, you tend to, as a, a youth, um, you tend to follow the footprints of, of what you know. And I knew teaching. After about two years, I realized this is not um, a career for me. I wanted something a little bit different. I had a background in athletics. I was on an national team for both um, for triathlon and then an Ontario team for cycling. And so I wanted something a little bit more active. So I was looking at the police force and, and fire. And it was just a fortunate thing. I competed against about 2,500 people for a position as a firefighter. And I was one of 16 to be successful. And really, I don't know how that happened. But uh, certainly, I'm very thankful that um, my career path has, has taken me to where I am today. So in other words, career paths are not carved in stone. Absolutely, Your Honor. And quite honestly, I've just been so fortunate. Every time uh, an opportunity, a door has opened with an opportunity, I just, I take it and see where it, it leads me. Wonderful, wonderful to hear. Um, let me turn to the next one on my list, which is Beth Lai. Hi, Beth. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Fellow panelists and participants online, I'm Lieutenant Commander Beth Lay, and it's a privilege to be a part of this panel discussion today. 
Um, I joined the Canadian Forces in Toronto, the Naval Reserve at 18, and it's turned into a lifelong career. I've had the opportunity to sail on both coasts, deploy to Afghanistan, Sudan, Egypt, and most recently to South Sudan as the Canadian Deputy Task Force Commander. Um, I've attended other conferences and heard from many people who seem to have this laser focus of their goals and a tremendous awareness of their path. But as I reflected on my experiences, I have to say I'm not that person. <laughs> <laughs> I followed my interests in my undergraduate um, and came out with a bachelor's in sociology. And during my naval career, I was introduced to alternative dispute resolution and that led to two advanced degrees. Today, I am working in Ottawa in the uh, Directorate of Professional Military Conduct, where we are working to address culture change and sexual misconduct in the Canadian Forces. Um, I wasn't fully aware of who I am or how the, all the pieces of my life would fit together, uh, military career, the education that I was pursuing, or how to frame my experience as an Asian woman. Uh, but I think by following my interests and the issues that I'm passionate about, I've discovered that it eventually all connects. Um, so coming, sorry? Wonderful, that you can figure it out. <laughs> I don't think I have it figured out. I just figured out that it does connect somehow. <laughs> Continue. Um, well, I became an aide de comp in 2015 and um, being a part of various events and hearing from extraordinary people have really helped to add another layer of awareness for me. And I think it's that awareness that helps to inform my choices today. Um, I'm also very much looking forward to what all my fellow panelists have to say, and I hope that I can bring value to today's discussion. Absolutely, absolutely. And the final one on my list, where is she? There she is, uh, Pauline. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Um, my name is Pauline Gray, and I'm a superintendent with the Toronto Police Service. I've served for about 33 years, although it feels like three. Um, and I am currently the officer in charge of uh, specialized criminal investigations, and that houses homicide, sex crimes, holdup, and forensic identification. I have about uh, just shy of 350 officers under my command, and I am blessed with uh, four pretty terrific inspectors who mind the farm. Um, I'm not unlike Beth. I didn't, my path wasn't linear. My path went from being a waitress uh, and bartender to seeing my sister. <laughs> I know that doesn't surprise you, Your Honor. Um, uh, my sister joined the RCMP uh, about a year and a half to two years ahead of me. And when I saw um, her experience and her love of what she was doing, I decided I, I might do that. And as it turns out, the year I decided to apply was the year they dropped the height restriction because I am a towering five foot two. And uh, that was the first year you could join not being a prerequisite five foot six. So I was grateful for that. Um, I've spent the bulk of my career in investigations with 12 years in the homicide unit as an investigator, which is my true love. And uh, other times I've worked in the drug squad, the gambling unit, um, domestic violence, and currently, um, uh, also uh, professional standards, which is our internal affairs, uh, sex crimes, and uh, a myriad of other things. I've been blessed to be uh, aid for about five years. Again, I saw somebody, uh, Deb Preston, who was a superintendent with the Toronto Police. She was an aide, and I actually saw her on television. And the next day, I cornered her uh, in the lobby and said, I want to do that, what you were doing. <laughs> I want to do that. And as it turns out, she was retiring uh, very shortly. And so she arranged for me to sort of step in her role. And I am grateful for it. I've had so much fun, so much fun over the last five years. Uh, I must tell you, that's a, a, a note for everyone. Everyone who knows her knows that Pauline has fun. And because she herself mentioned the question of height, let me just tell you that she's the only policewoman I know who can walk the beat in four inch heels as well. Uh, she does have a, a, a reputation. But one of the questions that I wanted to ask Pauline is um, because of your, uh, your love of fun, because of your humor, it, I've always been curious as to how you can work in a world that is so dark at times and yet always find the bright side of life. 
uh, policing is not an easy place to be and particularly some of the areas that you've been involved in. I agree, Your Honor, but I, I do think um, that the vast majority of us consider it a blessing to being able to do what we do, especially those of us who are in investigations and particularly uh, investigations into sexual assault and homicide investigations. Um, we cannot perhaps stop the crime from happening, but we can make sure that once uh, we are introduced to the survivors or victims' families that we can make sure that it's done um, to the very best of our ability. And uh, we really do. We really do consider uh, the fact that we are brought in as a blessing. And you, you, uh, I, I do believe that there's there's something, some bright spark or some bright light in even the worst tragedies. And you, some days you have to work particularly hard to find it, um, but uh, you do. And honestly. I, I, the being an aide is the bright light too. I mean, so when I've had a particularly uh, difficult day at work and I have an uh, event in the evening, there's nothing better than getting dressed in our, you know, accoutrement and showing up and having people happy to see us and introduced to all manner of humans that I would never get the opportunity. I went to the Aga Khan Museum with her honor for the moon exhibit with Roberta Bondar. I went with an ast astronaut. So, you know, it, those are the things that keep us, keep us focused and, uh, and keep us happy. Let's, uh, let's move then to a, a second question. Um, and that has to do with the role of an aide de camp. And I, I'd like you to give, be able to give the audience a, a, an idea of what it is you do and, uh, and, um, what, what reflections do you have on the role? Uh, you might uh, in particular think about uh, the role during a year of pandemic, of course, uh, which has, uh, has not been quite as busy for all of you. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious to what, uh, as to what you take away from why Vice Regals have an aide de camp. Uh, you're all volunteering. Uh, and I should say for those of you listening in that this is just a small subset of aides from all over the province. You may wonder why there are so many and it's because we try, because most of them are working. Uh, this is the easiest way to get them to uh, uh, spare, free up some time if they don't have to travel places. Uh, and so there are people who volunteer from all over the province and, uh, and consequently you'll find that the entire household is quite an interesting mix. It's quite multicultural, multi-dimensional, as you can see. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very proud that we are able to uh, have people from all cultures and all and genders as well. So let me, let me turn and I'll just uh, uh, pick people at random uh, to talk about uh, uh, reflections on the role of an aide de camp and what your experience has been. But you can't tell any embarrassing stories. You know the you know the line: "What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas." So, <laughs> what happens in the car stays in the car. Uh, PJ, why why don't we start with you? Okay, Your Honor. Um, in large part, our role, as I see it, is to um, help the event organizers. You know, you have a wonderful team at the office that organize the event before we get there, but to make sure that all the protocols that are due to your office um, are taken care of and that the event runs smoothly. Um, we try to stay one step ahead uh, of, uh, of what's going on in the event so that it runs very smoothly. Um, but we're also that person that can connect with either the event organizers who are stressed and nervous uh, about meeting you or having you there, um, or just the average public who are often a little starstruck and, and, and anxious and make it an enjoyable experience. We can connect with them. We can make it safe for them to come up and talk to you um, and make it a welcoming environment uh, wherever you are uh, for everybody that's there. Do you have a particular anecdote that you remember from your time? Oh, um, I'll, le I'll let you think about that. We can <laughs> come you. back to it. Um, Beth, how about you? Well, I think PJ has really said it very well and, and described exactly what we do. Um, but I think there's also other elements to it as well, where um, 
we also assist in representing your office. And so for that, I think it's a huge responsibility um, and a privilege. Um, I understand that there's also the piece um, about listening to the community, listening to Ontarians um, and impacting those outside of ourselves. But I've also come to realize that as an aide de camp, um, my reflections are that these events have an impact on me as well. Do you know, I remember Beth, the first time I met you was a very important event. It was the, it was the weekend before I was invested and I had the privilege of flying uh, with a member of royalty uh, up to uh, KI on Big Trout Lake, my first visit to a fly-in Aboriginal community. Do you remember that? I absolutely do, Your Honor, yes. What an amazing experience that was. There are a lot of, a, a lot of firsts in this job, absolutely. Maggie, how about you? Um, well, Your Honor, uh, to, to go on uh, to what our, my colleagues had said as well, I think the thing that I enjoy doing um, as a de comp is, is making sure, as PJ said, that the event organizers feel comfortable and, and helping everything run according to plan so that your focus is to engage with Ontarians. Because in any of the um, activities that I've participated in with you, um, just the impact you have on people to let them know that this particular um, historical event, uh, cultural event, um, innovative uh, project that they're working on, whatever that thing is that brings them passion, when you arrive at an event and you see what they're doing and you recognize them, you can see that light in their eyes. It really makes a huge difference to them. So I think that part of the role of the aide de camp is to facilitate everything around that so that as much as possible, um, you can maximize every moment interacting with the Ontarians and really giving them that, uh, that recognition, which everyone loves to receive. You know, all of you teach me so much. I learn every day from every experience. I remember, Maggie, that um, I, I didn't grow up with any association with the military at all. And so I had very much to learn. And so I was always asking the dumb questions like, what does this medal mean? And what does this stripe mean? And, and where, what is the official rank ordering of things? And I remember uh, when you were at Base Borden, um, I, uh, I was at several events there where you just made me feel so comfortable because you seamlessly knew your way around the place and, uh, and were able to make it appear as if I did as well, which was, uh, which was a, bi a big treat. They, I must say that uh, so many of the aides, they immediately absorb the environment around them. I have seen tall, strapping black men in uniform, throwing their hats around, playing with kids or sitting on the floor and reading stories to young, to young children. Um, just some remarkable moments. We'll see some pictures later on uh, uh, in the, uh, as we conclude the session, that'll give you a, an indication of that. But, uh, but really, um, as they are telling you uh, uh, what they do and how important they are, um, it's, it's really hard to overemphasize um, the, the, the environment they create in which I do my work. Darren, what do you, what do you recall about, uh, about your time as, a, as an aide? Thank you, Your Honor. Today, so, I should say. Today, today. Um, my my day to day is very operational in in the fire service. So, as an aide de camp, what I tend to do is I tend to do a little bit of research. I do a little bit of research about the events because the events are outside of generally outside of my scope. It has a lot to do with arts or social justice, a number of different things that I don't uh, I don't normally. Um, get involved in in, in a day-to-day. -day. So I do some research on the event or the, the person running the event. Certainly when I go to the event uh, ahead of yourself, Your Honor, I try and meet a number of people and learn about their stories because it's my job to then 
introduce you to people so that they can share those uh, incredible stories. And often these events are, are being hosted and attending, attended by some incredible people that all have very um, inspiring personal stories, which I would like you to hear. So that, that tends to be what I do when I uh, attend a, an event before you, you arrive. That's wonderful. Pauline. Well, um, I do do the running, I get ahead of there and make sure that the environment is actually a safe environment for all of us and for your attendees to make sure that there are, um, you know, exits and entrances that we are all, um, you know, so we retain our dignity at all times. But I can tell you the thing that I think was that I took away or I take away is something that I wasn't expecting. And that is the role allows us in policing and in fire and in the military to not to to also humanize our role so people only see us when they're being pulled over or when you know the fire and all of a sudden us being with you your honor and being so close to you allows people to see us as uh, something different something different that they would normally picture us as and uh it's been amazing it's been amazing you know, one of the uh, events that I remember, Pauline, uh, I hope you do too, you accompanied me on a trip uh, to Northern Ontario at one point. And before doing the official visit um, over breakfast uh, in the morning, I, uh, I met with a group of women uh, for a cup of coffee the night before, because I really wanted to get the scoop on what the community was really like. And I some of them were Indigenous women and some were not. But I had this most wonderful coffee and dessert party. And I was so impressed because I was asking them what they were most preoccupied about. And of course, they talked about addictions of all kinds. But then they said, in the medium term, what really is concerning us is human trafficking. And I was just floored. Uh, I was I was amazed at they were so well versed in the topic, and they were so absolutely concerned. This was, you know, I, I thought of human trafficking along the 401. I didn't think of it in Northern Ontario. But the most remarkable thing was that there was Pauline, whose file this really was at the time, and she just calmly spoke to a couple of people, gave them some information, names and phone numbers, where to get information, she just immediately responded um, and they thought it was wonderful. Uh, and that's, that's what an aide can do. They can prepare me, but they can also go beyond that and they make connections long after I'm out of the picture. So if, uh, if the office of the Lieutenant Governor is, uh, is being seen to do its job, it's largely because of many of these women that you see on the screen. Dee, how about you? What, what will you take away from uh, the role of uh, aide de camp or a, a volunteer? Well, my experience is slightly different because I tend to be relegated in a good way to events that happen in the suite. And for those who are watching today and have never been, there are two events that happened during the year, they haven't happened because of COVID. One is the New Year's levy and the other is doors open where we have the doors open for the public to come and see. And the one tidbit I heard when I was starting out was that when people come to the suite, sometimes it's their only opportunity that they will have to be in the space and coming to an event that acknowledges them, acknowledges them excuse me. And my piece is to create an opportunity or a situation where they feel comfortable and at home as much as we can. I'm part of the family. And so even if it's as simple as talking about the art that's on the wall or um, just letting them know that they're not alone in an event. Sometimes people just come on their own. They don't even have a plus one with them. So it's making them feel that we're, they're part of just this inclusive experience and want to make it as memorable and as special and comfortable for them as possible. Indeed, indeed. Um, who have I missed? Robin. Well, thank you, Your Honor. Um, let me say this. 
uh, if I can be so candid, we get the best seat in the house because we hang out with the Lieutenant Governor. Um, <laughs> and that's a real, real neat thing as an aide de comp. Um, Paul, all my colleagues have touched on it. We meet the neatest people that we would never otherwise meet, save and accept the fact that we are with alongside the Lieutenant Governor. Our role is very, very important. We run ahead of you um, before every event because you know, Your Honor, if you're doing four or five events a day, you're getting dropped off by the OPP at the curbside and we become your eyes. So we are guiding you through that event, um, introducing you to the people that um, you need to be introduced to and other people that are just dying to meet you. Um, Pauline said it that as a police officer, this is really a unique role where people are so excited to see us because they know right behind this, you're coming. We, I've done so many neat things in my role as an aide to comp. I've had so many opportunities. Uh, the SARS concert um, with the, the Honorable uh, James K. Bartleman. I, I skied in my uniform, if you can believe this, with the Honorable David Onnelly as he learned how to sit ski. Um, I crisscrossed Northeastern Ontario with you, Your Honor, and we visited Elliott Lake and Sault Ste. Marie, and we crisscrossed all over Manitoulin Island and then ended our trip on the Chichamon going over to, to Owen Sound, all these neat things. But that's not what I'm getting out of this, this uh, role. I'll tell you quite honestly, it is the most humbling experience I can have. And, and Dee touched on it when we have doors open, when we have doors open Toronto, when we have your New Year's levy. And I was honored to, to be there for the signing of the, uh, the book when Queen Mum passed away. And the neat thing is these people that come to your suite, the immigrants, the visitors, um, people who would never otherwise have an opportunity to come to your suite, those who have whose lives have not been as kind or as fortunate, and, and they are so proud and so patriotic um, to be in the suite and, and be feel so close to the head of state by being in your suite because you keep your doors open. Um, it is the most humbling experience. And at the end of the day, as I leave your your office and I travel all the way up to Innisville and it's normally a two hour drive in any type of traffic. I'm so bloody proud that I'm a Canadian um, because everybody who comes to your suite makes me proud to be a Canadian. It, it, I know it sounds goofy, um, but that that's what I get out of this. I'm, I'm so proud to be um, serving the Lieutenant Governor, having this great opportunity, but to be a Canadian and to get to show your suite to people and to introduce the Lieutenant Governor to so many people. It just, it's a thrill of a lifetime every time. And I, I've never ever tired it. And, and that's, that's a good shot of morphine for me every trip home. It just um, being so attached and you just come alive. We come alive, I come alive when I'm when I'm working uh, for the Lieutenant Governor and working for you. Well, and, and I could say the 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 very same thing. That's that's the joy. This this job is it's not a job. This role that I inhabit is uh, is such a privilege. I should say, by the way, did you know just a, a little fact um, that uh, because you both mentioned the uh, New Year's levy, did you know that uh, it was only in the 60s that women were even allowed to come to a New Year's levy and they could only come if they were accompanied by a man. Uh, and it really was one of my predecessors, the Honorable uh, um, uh, Pauline McGibbon, who, uh, who actually allowed women to come on their own. And this was about 1974, again, about the same time we got women in policing. Uh, they were allowed to come to the New Year's levy. Can you imagine? I, I was just floored when someone passed along that piece of information to me. Robin, thank you for those uh, for those comments. Uh, I'll come back to that in just a moment, but I think I missed PJ on that the first go round on this. Track. No, I went first, Your Honor. Oh, so I got everybody. I think Amazing. So. I I'm uh, I'm still one of these. Um, uh, I'm not a techie, shall we say. So I'm learning how to moderate. 
But I, I wanted to pick up on Robin's comment because when we went into lockdown a year ago, almost precisely, the last event, uh, the last big public event we did was the Order of Ontario actually. So it was a huge event and then the doors closed. But it, um, it took me a little while to think through uh, what is the role of a vice regal during a crisis, during a challenge. And I must say, I have no other, um, no other better role model than Her Majesty, who, uh, who actually says the right thing at the right time. And it was really quite stressful to say, so what does a vice regal do during this period of time? You can't get in the way of the medical officers of health or the politicians who are trying to be very clear about their directions to people. And I think for me, it was about bringing continuity, uh, that tradition does matter, that in fact, um, we will get through this together, that, uh, that life goes on. And that's why we continue to try and do all of the award ceremonies, for example, we just do them differently. But it's also because the role is really standing apart from politics. And it's trying to care for the hearts and minds and souls of people. And I think Robin just so eloquently expressed that in terms of what motivates her. Uh, and that, that truly is the most wonderful, uh, as, as frustrating as these days have been where I can't get out to see people. Um, it is just the most wonderful thing uh, to be able to know that even by phone or by Zoom, you're able to connect with people all over this province and, uh, and find out how, how they're doing. I think that I may have forgotten Beth. Did I forget you that time, right? No, okay, someone, on the, someone in the chat room thought I'd forgotten you. All right, let me turn to the third and, and final um, section. And I guess um, it has to do with the call to action. Um, the theme for this year's International Women's Day is choose to challenge. And I would like to know if you have a message that you would have particularly for young people. Uh, certainly it's not only for young people, I'm, but I'm thinking of young women who have such potential these days and who, uh, who are, have experienced a, a tough year behind them. Uh, and so I'd like, to, I, I'd like you to be motivational and inspirational as you always are and, and say something to people and, and perhaps reflect on the, uh, the disproportionate impact that COVID has had on women uh, per se. I think there are some lessons that I hope we will have learned, but I think, uh, I think uh, as, we, as we look forward, uh, I think we'll want to take some lessons and, and I think each of you probably has something that, uh, that is quite, uh, quite instructive and quite important for people to hear, uh, particularly young people. So let me, let me start with um, uh, Darren. Thank you, Your Honor. So um, in preparation for International Women's Day, I met uh, with our public, educating, uh, public education team, which is actually, it's a small but mighty group of five. And, um, and so we have a, a social media challenge, uh, channel, we have Twitter. And so um, we did a lot of brainstorming about how we could um, celebrate and use that choose to challenge. And so uh, it was interesting, one of the public educators identified when I got promoted uh, to chief, while there was so much support, you know, from people of Mississauga all the way across Ontario and Canada in regards to my promotion, there was still the odd co comment, you know, about how can she be a firefighter, can she carry a man 260 pounds? And, you know, it, it, I, I thought to myself, what well, my role right now is not to carry a man down a ladder, but, you know, um, it's just about asking 
better questions in 2021. So I was so proud of the social media posts that our team uh, put out today. And so what happens is it starts out and it has all of those questions, the questions that we should not be asking in 2021, but they all came up on the screen. And then it went into video of, of all of our team, men and women. Um, and then at the very end, it has one of our firefighters, a female firefighters climbing a ladder and said, uh, saying is 2021, let's ask better questions. So I guess uh, to my, my answer to that is, let's all ask better questions in 2021 about you know stereotypes that's that is a wonderful uh, response to the question i must say uh darren that you don't know this but i was doing an event uh shortly after you were appointed uh, deputy um uh, the 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 promotion before the one you just have now and i was doing an event um in um in eastern ontario uh, with a group of uh, firefighters and uh, three or four of them came up as a group to say, we hear you got Darren <laughs> as one of your aides, how lucky you are. And I thought, what, what a remarkable thing that was. It was completely unsolicited, but uh, these men wanted to say that, uh, that I was just really fortunate to have some of your time and uh, and I couldn't agree more. So I uh, just wanted you to know that. Thank you, Your Honor. And I do thank all, all of my colleagues that have supported me to get me to this position. So I do, I do want to say that uh, I've had a, a lot of amazing people around me to help me get to this place. PJ, part of your part of your daily work is about uh, inspiring people into leadership positions and career paths that uh, may not be the ones they would have chosen what would what would you say to young women well i think you know looking at this panel and especially as led by yourself your honor um all of us in some way have broken through a glass ceiling we've done things that the generation before us maybe couldn't have imagined doing um so we've paved the path this far and i guess my challenge to the young women would be what are you going to do to take it even further than we've been able to do uh, up until now? All right, that is a bit of a call for action, is it not? Maggie. Um, I think that I would say in, in terms of choosing challenge it is to choose which challenge. Um, Early on in my career, uh, someone told me that their best advice was to say yes to every opportunity. And that is something that I did for a really long time. And without a doubt, all many of us have said that, you know, this is an opportunity they came up and, and everyone said yes, and it has been exceptionally fulfilling. Um, that being said, I, I would suggest to young ladies, to everyone in general, but to young ladies in particular, to choose which challenge. Um, this year has been really hard. Uh, and even before that, just through my own personal experiences and, and talking with, uh, I'm blessed to have a, a wonderful, wonderful group of girlfriends. And I see many of us saying yes to everything um, because there's almost that fear of disappointing someone. We want to please everyone. And so we say yes and yes and yes. And while great opportunities come when you say yes to things, I would really hasten people or, or, or ask people to choose which things they're going to say yes to because if you do say yes to everything, as you try to navigate career and family and children and, and all of those other things, you really do risk possibly burnout. And so it's so important to choose which challenges you're going to say yes to so that you can find and maintain that work-life balance. And everyone is going to have a unique balance. So don't, don't compare what you're saying yes to, to what other people are saying yes to. We all are, I'm not going to get the quote right, but I've seen it in relation to the pandemic, right? We might all be on the same uh, uh, stormy seas, but we're not all in the same type of boat or, or something like that, right? Um, so I think that would be my greatest advice is to just choose which challenges so that you know you're always maintaining your physical, your mental wellness while you're going about all these other activities. Easier said than done sometimes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Beth. So I love that uh, naval analogy, first of all. <laughs> it was awesome. Um, I think when I think back, people have always asked me, um, how is it that I managed to deploy so often? Um, and so I don't really have a clear answer for that. And I, I've, when I think back, I, I say, you know what? I've just asked. When an opportunity arises, right? And when I want something, I will ask for it. And so I would suggest that young women today not be afraid of asking for what they want and to seek out their goals. Um, not be afraid to try new things because you never know what you can be capable of doing. Um, I learned that through my military experiences um, over and over again. I think, oh, I can't, I can't march that far. You know, I can't, um, I can't climb over that wall. And over and over again, the military tells me, no, no, you can. And so I take that with me. And, um, and I hope that other women, other young women will eventually be able to feel that and experience it for themselves as well and realize um, how capable they are and how adaptable and resilient we all are. And so I feel like all of those skills um, are also what help to contribute in helping me to manage this year as well, being resilient and being adaptable. Did, can I just ask you, Beth, did you, have you learned some lessons from specifically from the various places you've deployed to? You've had the experience of being in several places around the world. And one of the things we're learning during this pandemic is that we need to be aware of what's going on in the rest of the world because we're not going to get out of this until everybody gets out of it. Uh, yes, I think there's a whole spectrum of things that I've learned. So um, I'm not sure even where to start. Um, I've found that uh, uh, fundamentally building relationships and communication skills are key to being successful wherever I've gone, um, being respectful of people and hearing them um, have made a world of difference and have made me more effective in the roles that I've been in. And that's helped me to accomplish or to look like I'm accomplishing things in my role. Um, I think that's one big piece that I come away with and I carry with me all the time. Valuable lessons for all of us, not just for, for young women. Dee, how about you? It's funny you're calling on me next because I feel that uh, a couple of things that Beth said really resonated and was sort of leading towards what I was going to say. That uh, when I work with my students, the, uh, the two things I say to them is number one, ask as many questions as you can. That I always feel that if you're in a situation where you don't quite know what's going on or you're, you're sort of thinking about some things in the back of your head. So many other people are, they, they easily just sort of take the back seat and listen and just wait for information to sort of come upon them and then just take that. But the people that make the biggest impression are the people that ask and ask and ask and they're thinking of other ways that the situation could be and they're continuously trying to explore it. And I think that's so interesting, not only for the per person asking the questions, but also for, for whoever's on the receiving end. The other piece of advice I have is that if you're given an opportunity to be in a situation you haven't been in before, be a sponge. It's so interesting to just sort of sit back and observe and, but really absorb what's going on around you and take those, those experiences in and see what you can benefit from. And again, if you need to ask more questions, then, then do so. But to really take advantage of opportunities that you can ask about and be sort of a bit more forthright, as Beth was saying, ask, you know, can I, can I take part in this? Can I observe? Can I listen in on a phone call? Can I observe a Zoom call? Whatever it is. And then learn from the situation and do more Googling or online reading or whatever to learn more about that. Thank you so much. In fact, that your, your comment about uh, taking advantage of Zoom calls, one of the one of the positive elements of this past year has been the accessibility of so many opportunities to listen to others, to be part of Zoom calls. Normally you'd have to buy a plane ticket and go to a conference somewhere. And this has allowed us, this experience has allowed us as much as we have time available to actually listen to uh, others of, of all stripes. Uh, that's been quite wonderful. Pauline. Um, Your Honor, 
for the choose to challenge, I noticed that there are three steps in all of them. So choose to challenge can be challenge others. Um, and I noticed that the, it's our, we're having it that our hand is up. That is challenge others, like have those hard conversations. If you're not good at them, get good at them. Very important. I think challenge yourself by saying, by putting your hand up for things. And more importantly, and I can tell you, excuse me, all the women on this call is use that hand to reach back, reach back, uh, grab somebody and bring them forward so that you mentor, you coach, and you bring the next generation through. So all three, challenge yourself, challenge others, and challenge those behind you. So that's what I take. But and I can say, just keep, uh, to Beth's point as well, just keep in their face. Just keep putting your hand up that, you know, just make them give you something because you just won't go away. <laughs> and Robin. I think Pauline covered off uh, pretty well everything I wanted to say, Your Honor. Um, the, the reaching back resonates most with me that, you know, it's been a tough year. It's a tough life. If COVID goes by and it will, something else will crop up. We all are, it, there are, there's always challenges in life. Um, and we also have crappy days. We all have crappy days at work. We have crappy days at home. Um, whatever, but we get through it. But don't ever forget to reach behind and pull somebody along with you and get them up to you. Don't ever stop asking how somebody is doing and truly stop and listen to see and hear how they are doing and give them feedback and pay attention to what they're saying to you. Um, I've always said, and I said this during our, when I coached uh, girls hockey and, and ball is, that we are, we have to take care of ourselves, gals, um, because at the end of the day, it's us and we are different. We come from different backgrounds, but if we need to have a united front, stick together and help each other out, and and that will make a better place to live and a better place and a better place to to go home to. It will just make you much happier. So don't ever stop helping out and listening to the other person and. Uh, Giving that, giving that hand when they need, we all need a little bit of help sometimes. So I, I, I'll leave it at that, Your Honor, but uh, that- uh, I, need, I need a little help all the time. And I'm just so fortunate to have all of you, as, as I say, as part of my extended family. You know, early in my uh, term, I developed an initiative that I called Unfinished Business. And it was designed to shine a light on the need to empower women and girls. And to date, I think we have either organized or attended well over a hundred events on this theme alone. I hadn't realized it was so many till someone uh, very kindly added them up. But each of those events has been an opportunity to honor those who have paved the way as trailblazers, to recognize those who've made such incredible sacrifices but also one of the real joys of the opportunity I have is to find a safe space for listening, listening to each other about the challenges that are faced. And that's what I would like people to think about the Lieutenant Governor's Office, that it is a safe space for those conversations. I think that's never been more important than during this year of COVID and the year ahead as we as we all start to design a, a better normal. Women have been disproportionately impacted. And I think there are so many lessons that we need to build on. Certainly the lesson of inequity uh, remains front and center. COVID has just laid bare some of the, the real questions, the real conversations that we need to have, like who matters and, and who's essential. I continue to, uh, to be inspired uh, by the people that I've talked to. My, my sincere thanks to each of these women and the, the full cast of characters uh, that I have as volunteers. These are only a few that I could get on the screen today. I am so fortunate to be surrounded by loyal professionals. I'm humbled by their 
empathy, their dedication, and as you've seen, they're all very proud Canadians. And aren't we lucky that they've chosen a, a life of service? Thanks all, also to all of you who have joined us in the call today, um, mothers and fathers and families and colleagues and just people who've, uh, who've been uh, part of uh, the connections that we've made at the Lieutenant Governor's office. Um, I, uh, I hope the conversation has caused you to challenge some assumptions. And I hope that it allows you to recall those women and girls in your lives who really matter. Um, Robin, you had your hand up for just a moment before I move to the final phase of our event today. If I may, Your Honor, and I hope I'm not stepping out of town or out of um, place here, but uh, to recognize our very first female aide de camp, who was Major Peggy Downs, who served or was appointed under John Blackaird, Lieutenant Governor, Lincoln Alexander, Hell Jackman, Hillary Weston, and James Bartleman before she passed away in 2009. She, she was the highest ranking uh, reservist in the military, uh, Major Peggy Downs, uh, before she, she retired. And uh, she served, she was an aide de camp. And I, I don't think the gals, my colleagues here ever had the pleasure of meeting with her, but she was a spark plug in the office, Your Honor. And I always enjoyed working the events with uh, Major Downs. And uh, she wasn't only female, the first female, but she was the first black female. And the neat thing about Peggy is that in her history, um, because she came out east, she, in her history, she had Viola Desmond fix her hair because her hair had gone wild because the military made her swim to stay in shape. So I think that's a really neat piece of history attached to uh, your office, Your Honor. And I just want to recognize Peggy, Major Peggy. In, indeed. I didn't get to know her either, but, uh, but I hear wonderful stories about her. And in fact, what, I'm going, what we're going to move to now is a final moment of a photographic montage featuring some of these women. And she is in that photographic montage. So thank you again to everyone. Um, have a happy International Women's Day. Be safe and well. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank, thank you so much.